Welcome back, everybody. It's uh, Monday. Monday, Monday. I'm back in the freezing cold land of Toronto after a glorious five days in pretty much freezing cold Miami. Was it cold in Miami? And it wasn't really cold, but it was chilly. Was it 60? Uh, 60? What's that in centigrade? 16. 16. It was uh, 16. Actually, it did get up to 24, 27 uh, later on in the week. Did you, did you go into the ocean? Didn't go into the ocean. It wasn't warm enough to go into the ocean. There was no reason to get into the ocean and get wet. Plus, I didn't have my CBDs with me, so I was kind of out yeah. of sorts. Well, you should be able to find them down there, shouldn't you? You would have thought, but I didn't. I couldn't. You, you would have thought they would have found you. <laughs> you would have thought, yeah. Well, that's, that would certainly be the hope. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, you know what? Uh, lots of action here. Chronos stepping into the big uh, picture, the big throwing her hat in the ring. Yeah. Yeah, never mind that. You know who we've got joining us today, Ed, on the show? Chronos. No idea. No! We've got Steve Hawkins from the uh, HMMJ. The, the Horizon ETF. Horizon that, ETF, yeah, Canada. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, Steve Palmer, who is uh, the CEO and Chief Investment Officer of Alpha North Asset Management. And uh, we've got a trivia question. And our Ben Smith's back. And Ben Smith is going to be here. We're going to talk about this, that, and the other thing, as per usual. Ben is going to give us his insightful, incisive insight. Oh, that was kind of repetitive. Redundancy. Insightful insight. Hmm. Insightful insight. Let's just say there's lots going on. Lots going on today. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. And although, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm astounded by the the the. The buzz around the city, yeah. trying to get in restaurants. I mean, everybody's, you know. Trying to get in restaurants. Well, you know, it's Christmas lunch. You know, you know. Dore, dore. What do you think of the new shirt, Ed? Hey, anybody liking the new shirt? Yeah. Hey, 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 yeah, Miami yeah. special. Woohoo! Yeah. Can't get it in Canada. No, 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 no. Anyways, yeah. Very so, colorful. Uh, yeah, thank you. I got, uh, I got a selection for. Uh, you know, tantalizing the audience with for the rest of the week. And they're not Christmas colors. They're not Christmas decorations. There's no Christmas whatsoever involved with anything to do with, you know, any of that. So, so uh, what did you do on the weekend, Ed? Oh, went to a, a pretty, pretty uh, interesting Christmas party. Interesting how? Uh, interesting in, the, in the, you know, like... Lots of substance abuse, I'm assuming. Well, yeah, you know, without going into details. <laughs> You got a pretty guilty smile on your face. Yeah, there. One would say yeah. guilty pleasure. You look there. tired. <laughs> you mean just, just <laughs> so you right. look tired? Yeah. 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 Like you know, there's fungi. Fun. Fungi. The next F legal fun guys thing to be legalized and fungi. here. Fun guy. Fun guys. We're, we're having some fungi. Little Bolivian marching powder. <laughs> Little yeah. chocolatey Thought I'd chocolate. Thought I'd, I'd climb a few mountains after that, <laughs> feeling that my uh, oh, ability to withstand uh, altitude sickness was. Uh, no problem. You could have jogged up a 10,000 foot cliff. We're standing on top of the building here thinking, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Well, so. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so party, party central, and uh, then, you know, nice you. food, west part of town. Yeah, good, good, good for you. I noticed I missed quite a bit of the action with the Free and Kronos in uh, Liberty Health Sciences last week. And I was really disappointed to be, you know, gallivanting around the yeah. planet for yeah. that because, uh, oh, got a few perspectives of my own that I like to throw in here but this week Ben Smith and I are going to so we know that a free is going to come out with its line by line rebuttal of the Hindenburg report really? so we're going to line them up in a in a spreadsheet and we're going to go through and evaluate the response of each yeah. on each item and we're going to score them and figure out we're going to choose a winner okay, can I can I maybe throw out a little suggestion here since that you guys are going to have a little banter. Caucus. Why don't you have a little point counterpoint? Point counterpoint. That's what you and I do. No, but but I'm I'm saying on this specific. Uh, one of us runs the barricade. One one, one of us, of us makes us. You say, well, I think this, and the other one says, well, look at you, stupid idiot. This is what <laughs> this is what I think. That's and not I'm the right. kind of language I would no, use. No, but there used to be that 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 news show where they'd have point counterpoint. There was mm -hmm. a woman, an elder, a senior newsman and a senior news lady mm -hmm. and it was called point counterpoint so i'm just mm. you know throwing oh, okay. it out there just throwing so it out there which one of us has to be the lady mm, well <laughs> <laughs> 
you were the one who was laying claim to a big uncomfortable bulge earlier, but I um, yeah. think that you're yeah. just a little bit too optimistic about your own plumbing. Uh, anyways, <laughs> yeah. plumbing. the reality is, is that it's time for some news, and here's Ricky Gerwitz with some news for you. Oh. Thanks, and here are the headlines moving markets today. Aurora Cannabis Inc. has entered into a letter of intent to acquire all of the issued and outstanding shares of Farmacias Magistralas S.A. subject to customary due diligence provisions, the completion of definitive agreements, and regulatory and government approval. Farmacias recently became Mexico's first and only federally licensed importer of raw materials containing THC. This transaction establishes Aurora's first mover advantage in one of the world's most populous countries, where more than 130 million people will have federally legal access to a range of Aurora's non-flower medical cannabis products containing THC. Emblem Corp announced the launch of a new line of 10 milligram emblem oil capsules, providing its growing list of more than 6,000 patients with a pre-dose treatment format. The capsule is designed to help patients better manage their treatment through precise dosing of their cannabis medication. Emblem's medical cannabis products will be available to patients through their website and soon through Shoppers Drug Mart. Even Co. Incorporated announced that Health Canada has authorized Natural Medco Limited, a wholly owned subsidiary of the company, to use its previously constructed 100,000 square foot second flowering room as a grow area and a packaging room as an operations area. With the addition of these approved areas, Evenco now has 220,000 square feet of licensed grow and operation areas. The company expects harvesting to commence at its newly licensed second flowering room by late March 2019. Cresco Labs has released its third quarter 2018 financial results. Highlights include a third quarter revenue of $12.2 million, up 335% year over year and 51% quarter over quarter, year-to-date revenue of $25.1 million, up 248% from the prior year. They successfully raised $205 million in growth capital through three capital raises in 2018, and they are now operating in seven states with binding transactions pending in two more states. And that's your news for today. Crisco. 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 Oh, that's a lard company. Oh, that's, I thought it was a sexual lubricant company. <laughs> Anyways, uh, enough about that. I was curious about that Cresco. I mean, so the numbers look very glowing, but they didn't report any net income or net loss, which I would well, be very e interested in. They, they reported it and we didn't report it. Yeah, I'm going to uh, check it out right now. Check actually. it out. Let's see. Check it Cedar out. Cedar and check, uh, check, Cresco. Check it out. Now that's uh, that's an interesting name, Cresco. So uh, Cresco's been getting quite a bit of positive press from. What's the ticker for Cresco? Cresco's symbol is uh, CL on the CSE. The CSE. So that would be CNX over here. Yeah, that's correct. C CL. CL. Financial statements of RTO acquirer. Oh boy, it's not going to be easy to see. All right, consolidated financial statements for the three months ended. Let's just go straight to the net income last slash loss line. Loss from operations. Well, actually, the gain from operations was 3.8 million. Well, here we go, there it is. Right. Net income, 3.9 million. What? So this is a company that actually made uh, 4 million bucks in the last quarter. That's cr no wonder people are getting excited about Cresco. I'm not used to seeing that many. Look at that. You're not used to seeing that money or that many. That much money in the uh, on the that on the plus that side. Many money. That much those many. I've never monies. seen that many money. You've seen that many monies. I've never seen that many money. <laughs> that many money is hard to come by. So, anyways, that's so that's interesting. A lot, lot of nice, nice. I'd income. like to go through in that uh, financial statement with my accounting hat on. Yes. Okay. Go for it. Well, I don't have my hat with me right now. <laughs> Where's your accounting hat? What hat do you have on? Uh, your transparent hat? My invisible hat. <laughs> your invisible hat. You know, Did you ever see the... It the, must be invisible. The, I can't see it. The, uh, the If it's invisible, can I still feel it? You know the, it? The, the comedian, the, the famous comedian, Carl... Uh, uh, Lagerfeld? No, Carl. Uh, not Carl. 
anyway. George Carlin? George Carlin, yeah. Where, where, where he talks about the biggest con in, 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 in the world, and he talks about, you know, there's the political bullshitters, but they can't touch a candle to the, to the clergy. The clergy. That's the con of all time. You know, <laughs> like, you know and he, he says, God always needs money. Always needs money. <laughs> always needs money. Yeah, he, he can do everything, but he still needs money. Huh. Anyway, you got to see it. it, and I've seen it a few times, and I played it on the weekend, and it is very funny. I, w I wonder how the uh, faithful among our viewers are regarding that kind of line of commentary. Well, you, you know what? Everybody's <laughs> entitled to their view. Full disclosure. I don't think they are, you know. I think there's at some point you got to say, you know what? No more talking that bullshit. You're driving people crazy. You're killing people on the basis of some well, total bullshit premise. Anyways, anyway. let's not go down there. That's no, let's talk worse than talking politics, talking religion. I just see Cantrust going across here down 31, and I just want to make a point that oh, apparently oh. Mm. Altria was looking at Cantrust, Afria, and Kronos. Huh. And, they, and they picked, they went with Kronos. Really? But, but you know, I always thought Cantrust already being profitable. Yeah. Maybe they couldn't get the right deal. Maybe they... Well, I think the Cantrust uh, would be complicated by the fact that they have an existing relationship with Apotex, which is the multi-billion dollar global provider of, of generic, generic yeah, yeah, and drugs. That's, that's Barry Sherman. in 115 Sherman. countries. Barry Sherman's no longer with us. Former Barry Sherman. The, the actor formerly yeah, known yeah, as Barry yeah. Sherman. Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, so I think that probably complicated that mixture, and okay. I think Kronos Group was attractive because they're already very U.S. centric in their mind and management, and and also in a number of different things that are sprouting, sprouting, oh, popping up, growing as it were. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, so. While we're at it, Ed, why don't we take a look at what's going on in the marketplace today? And yeah. uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to kick it off here with a, uh, oh, let's look at the intraday large cap index, shall we? Is that in, in your uh, world, the, the uh, Midas letter market cap? Oh, uh, what? Sorry, what was that, Ed? There's a question on the screen. James Albert, what's your opinion on Vivo Cannabis? They seem to be sitting on a pile of cash, but very little news. What's the deal? When were they abcan? They seem to have so much promise. Well, here's the thing. What's the ticker Vin for Vivo? Vivo is uh, Vivo. V-I-V-O, I think, isn't it now? Anyways, uh, Abidus, uh, or rather, abcan was taken over uh, in management by Barry Fishman. And so Barry Fishman has been very deliberately and indelibly putting his mark on, uh, <coughs> on the company. And uh, I would say that I have, uh, I have great hopes for Vivo because, um, because of Barry Fishman's involvement. Uh, it certainly hasn't been a very dynamic or visible company relative to others in the space. Mind you, the companies that have been dynamic and visible in the space are either doing billion dollar deals over here or they're getting attacked by shorts over yeah. there. So if you're somewhere in between that mix, you're not very visible in this market. I would think also that given the, the contraction in the cannabis valuations over the last quarter since the end of September, that a lot of companies are thinking, you know, maybe let's hold back on putting out our, you know, showing our best face to let's the market. Let's keep some compound, gunpowder here. Let's, let's uh, keep our powder dry. Don't, let's not show the whole elephant. Let's, <laughs> let's not show the whole elephant. Well, actually, it's an old Chinese proverb, don't show the elephant, meaning when you go to war, don't show everything you have. Hey, you got a little uh, reserve. But then again, you know, then you've got that other guy who had the uh, the ceramic army, who clearly did not agree with that sentiment because he created all these. I just fake put soldiers. up a chart of Vivo uh, mm. for the for the benefit of our uh, viewer. Oh, and it and it's clearly <laughs> in a down downward channel. Uh, not not that that means much in this world we're in because uh, it could be getting ready for a big blast up, but it. You can see a, a well-defined channel that goes back. I'm going to say uh, that's a six-month chart. So about three, three, four months. Dropped from about a buck eighty down to seventy-five cents, and now it's back to about ninety cents, hmm. eighty-six cents. All right. Trading quite a bit of volume. That that used to be AB Can, right? Yeah. Abcan. Yeah. Okay. No. 
Yeah, and, and we, we, we have to talk about the S&P, because I think the S&P did some interesting, there was some interesting action there today. I'm gonna put that chart up. Just intraday? To, yeah, I'm gonna put up, uh, because it, it, you know what, this S&P, if it rolls over, and we've been talking about how it looks like it's, it's, uh, it's uh, trying to trying to find a, a level to, to, to bounce off of. Mm -hmm. And at one point it was, I think that the swing today in the S&P was 50 S&P points down to 20, I think 2583. Yep. And here it is as we speak, 2626. Hmm. Big, big swing and the, the, this was new low territory for the S&P since we've had this big correction uh, that started in October. But now it's back in, you know, it, let, let just. Well, what's the cause of all that, Ed? Well, you know, you, you know what, I think we need, to, when, you, when you have a severe bottom, you need uh, 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 quite a lengthy bottoming process. So, so there was the first time, and here we did this, and it, did, it wasn't as quite as low, but rallied here, and then, I know this, this may be uh, repetitious to some of yours, but James, James wasn't here last week, so. Plus some of my memory shot, and, and, so. And, and, and in here, we, we breached, with this last candle, I just hid the candle. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna try and, uh, yeah, so the fact that it's come back up and, and, and is, is above the highs here, I think that's, that's very, uh, very positive. Hmm. So, so, so far, so good. I, I'm gonna say, you know, yeah, I, I'm saying it's looking bad on Friday today, I'm saying it's not looking so bad, but it, it's a bottoming process, so. You know, hmm. Apple, Apple's down quite a bit from, from the highs, so as is Amazon, as is a lot of the FANG stocks. Yeah. Well, I would say that, uh, you know, one of the main reasons that the FANG stocks are down so heavily is because the interest rates are inching up. So companies are not able to access capital as cheaply as they could to buy back their shares, to which has been the principal driver of valuation in the whole tech sector since 2010 since the onset yeah. of quantitative easing and, and zero interest rate policy. And you know, S Steve Meisner has a, has a view on this as well, and he said if you look at the new highs versus new lows, just, just by focusing on the fangs, which are so big that they move the averages, but there's a lot, of, lot more new lows being, being reached. Yeah. But you don't, you don't get that by focusing on that, the, lead, the leadership group, so right. to your point. Yeah, yeah, so uh, what do you think? What do you think is happening? Yeah, you know, I, there's it's a, there's a lot change, and coupled with this this stuff with Huawei and and the arrest of that CFO and uh, you know global pressure, trade war. I mean, it's interesting that they arrest this woman right about the time they're agreeing that they're going to work together to try to come up with a trade deal. Yeah, I thought that was kind of like what? Yeah, like. Well, that's uh, Wait, is typical. the left hand is the left hand w looking at the right hand? What's going on? Not in that administration, Ed. I don't think yeah, so. Yeah. Maybe. Anyways, uh, okay. I had a uh, visit from Steve Hawkins, CEO of uh, Horizons uh, ETF Management Canada, and here's what he had to say. Oh, good. Welcome back, my guest. This segment is Steve Hawkins, CEO of Horizons ETF Canada. Steve, welcome back. James, thank you for having me. Steve, the uh, cannabis market has been a bit of a disappointment lately, I think we can all agree, and tax law selling notwithstanding, there's been some negative developments. Uh, a bunch of short strategists have come out with some pretty ugly reporting against Afria and Liberty Health Sciences, uh, and at the same time, we saw Kronos do that deal with Altria, a $2.4 billion transaction that you would have thought result, would have resulted in more upside. So what is, the, uh, what is the cause of all of this negativity? I mean, a lot of it is just the general market sentiment, what's going on right now. I mean, um, it's not just tax loss selling. The equity markets are extremely volatile right now, and, and we're seeing severe downticks. You know, when the S&P 500 on uh, Thursday, Friday last week, notwithstanding, marijuana stocks were generally up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when the market is quiet and, and on a steady roll up, People, there's not a lot of news which is happening, there's not a lot of developments in the marijuana space, and we're seeing things tick down, tick right. down because of the high valuations that are already existing. But, you know, it's uh, general market movements are, are not good for marijuana stocks right now. Positive right. news, like the Kronos uh, Altria deal, is very, very positive. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, yet the market, there was no uptake. Is that because all of this negativity has sort of put a paralyzing effect on investor sentiment? I, I think that's one, uh, one, especially at this time of the year as well, people are trying to understand what is going on with their money. It, it's, it's interesting though, because last year was a complete reversal. We had very similar news which came out like at the end of November, start of December last year, and we saw a huge wave of money rush into marijuana companies going through December and early January last year, whereas the regular stock market was going down the whole time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a complete market reversal. I mean, the nice thing about the Altria Chrono Steel is that, so that's one shoe that's dropped. What's going to happen next? We have Philip Morris, we have Imperial. You know, these companies have to make moves into the space. They can't sit back and just wait for um, the marijuana companies to continue to eat their lunch. Sure. So, uh, and that's just big tobacco. What is big pharma going to do? You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and we see the Shoppers Drug Mart deal, mm -hmm. um, being able to sell online. I mean, these are all things which are going to be very, very positive for the marijuana market going forward. So it sounds like you're long-term bullish, short-term bearish. Uh, right now, I'm actually, I said that's probably a pretty good sentiment. I'm actually in the point of, uh, you know, I think that we're going to see some consolidation mm -hmm. at this level from a price perspective. Um, and we're going to probably stay in a little bit of a range until we get another nice piece of news which will break us out. So right now I'm I'm probably in the process of buying a little bit more in the, in the cannabis space. Sure. Um, but I'm still long term bullish absolutely. Right. So what then how does how does the Horizons ETF deal with this kind of negativity? How do you perform? Well, over the past month, I mean, most of the marijuana companies were down pretty sizably. I mean, we had um, Afria down 60% in the past month. Um, Aurora weed down 20% in the past month, but you see Kronos up 50% and then you see Tilray down um, maybe 10%. You know, uh, the Horizons Marijuana Life Sciences ETF was down 15% over the past month. On a relative basis, if you took 20% of each of those top five companies, Aurora, Afria, Kronos, Tilray, and Canopy, we were uh, we slightly outperformed that basket of five stocks. But are people out there owning those five stocks? Generally not, right? They're taking mm -hmm. bets on one or two. Right. And if you bet on Afria, you got the crap beat out of you. Right. And, and, not, and there are not a lot of people that owned uh, Kronos to the same degree, right? In Canada anyway. So, um, you know, Weed and Aurora, you know, stood in reasonably nicely, but they were still down, you know, almost 20% over the past month. So sure. um, for us, again, owning a diversified basket of uh, cannabis companies, we believe is the most important way to get access to the space, simply because you don't want to be taking these individual bets. You don't want to have one company where you just lost 60% and you didn't own the company that was up 50%, right? Right, right. right. Huh, so do you uh, position yourself, are you positioning yourself right now more for exposure to the US market at all, or are you still focused mostly on Canada or what combination of? Um, I'm, we're in HMMJ. We're primarily focused on the Canadian market only. Um, we can't really invest in companies that have U.S. operations. Mm. So the MedMens and things like that are not in oh, um, our primary portfolio. They're in our index, but we can't invest in them because we want to maintain our TSX listing. And these are the same rules that apply to Canopy, Aurora, Afria, anybody who's listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange really has to follow the guidelines of the TSX, which means no US um, uh, production, cultivation, distribution exposure in your portfolio. Right. But that said, you know, there's lots of new product ideas that are coming out there where we want to invest in US companies. Um, and you know, down the road, I mean, we've, we've seen such a proliferation of the U.S. companies coming to Canada now. CSC, I don't know how many, I think there's 45 listings of U.S. companies in Canada right now on the CSC. And we see that as the primary driver of the capital markets for the, for the U.S. companies and raising cash flow, capital, they're coming to Canada. Yeah. Uh, they're listing here in Canada. And the CSC is doing a great job of becoming, you know, the cannabis exchange of the world kind of thing. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, whereas the TMX has, has got their own rules. Um, and we see a lot more opportunity potentially down the road for U.S. companies. So, you know, we're def as an ETF provider, you know, we're looking to bring product to marketplace that people want where there is potential for you know, increased exposure down the road. We can't put U.S. exposure in our in our uh, primary product. Um, so, do we want to create a second product or a third product that is going to provide only exposure to the U.S. Where we see 
on an overall valuations perspective, significant more ability for uh, gains uh, to be had on a relative basis. Mm -hmm. You know, we have these high valuations in Canada, and we have, for whatever reason, lower valuations out of the U.S. companies because they're not as well known here, right? Right. Uh, there's uh, there's been a few uh, IPOs that have come to the market recently that were typically billion-dollar IPOs governed by super voting structures where a couple insiders control the whole the whole thing for all intents and purposes and the last few of them have really sort of discounted right off the hop from their IPO price. Do you think that's having a chilling effect on the cannabis space generally as well? A little bit, uh, for sure. I mean, um, and it, you know, a lot of that again is because the U.S. market doesn't have access from a regulatory perspective to the Canadian equity marketplace the same way that um, Americans can buy uh, U.S. companies listed on the U.S. exchanges, right? So um, uh, Canadians can easily buy any Canadian stock, any U.S. stock. Americans can't necessarily buy Canadian companies the exact same way. So mm -hmm. very, very different trading atmospheres for both um, all parts of the people that want access to the market from the direct investors, the retail advisors, to the institutional investors. So that creates regulatory arbitrage from a cross-border perspective um, and creates more difficult from a capital markets perspective. And so you see these nice IPOs come out in, in Canada, but again, there's there's just a general overall calmness to the market or, or you know, coldness to the market, as you said. And so these IPOs are coming out and, and there's always Typically, when you see big companies like Facebook, you know, when it went IPO, there's a retracement because there's a there's a big controlling group of shareholders. There's a market value where it got priced at an IPO perspective, and you see a pullback. And then what happens after that? You see people consolidating, and you see people move money into the marketplace, and you see there's not lots of new prospects. But it's not like every IPO that's going to come out is going to be hot off off the off the uh, newsprint and and going to. Uh, shoot the lights out. You know, right, that's right. it's not Tilray anymore. Right. So do you think in 2019 investors have to be cognizant of the fact that there's an increasing availability of product, but the quality level is might be going down a little, so you need to be a little bit more focused on fundamentals? A absolutely that is the case. You okay. know, before there was only 15 issuers that you could buy. Now there's a hundred plus issuers that you can buy, right? So um, being um, diversified from an exposure perspective is very, very important. And you're going to have to do your homework if you want to get into this space. You bet. All right, Steve, I appreciate your insight as usual. That was great. We'll come back to you in due course. Thanks for joining me today. Gotta love Steve Hawkins. Yeah. Always got a right thing to say. You know, he's, uh, he's, he's polished. Yeah, yeah. Do you, uh, do you concur with that idea, Ed, that the, uh, the general negative sentiment in the cannabis space is actually just a reflection of the broader negative sentiment market-wide as a result of the confluence of tax loss selling, geopolitical instability, and macroeconomic uncertainty as a result of the rising interest rate environment in the U.S. Yeah, but I like this point about there's more and more issuers coming in, right? True. And, and so the quality of those issuers probably can't be as good as the, some of the earlier ones. You or, know, my uncle had a picture of a boat on the wall, and it was a boat full of hippopotamuses. And in this picture, there were hippopotamuses. Hippopotami or hippopotamus? hippopotami were jumping increasingly onto the boat, and the boat was getting lower and lower in the water. And the caption of the picture said that more is not always better. <laughs> and for some reason, that goofy little image you know has what? stayed that, my I head for that. my whole I life. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I it's important to remember. If you need to visualize, a condition where more is not always better, you can think of either A, the hippopotami in the boat, or the cannabis market. Or just saying less is more. <laughs> well, less is not necessarily more either. Well. Like, uh, I'll give you a, here's a, here's a visualization of that. Penile amputation. Mm. <laughs> I'll leave you with I'm gonna, that little, I'm gonna rush right out. That little juicy thought. I can't, um, I can't wait. I bet you can't. But did you know what? We got a trivia question. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Ben Smith. Okay. Just like that. So, should I leave this here? Okay, so this is what we're asking today. When was the first recorded instance of psychoactive marijuana use? Was it A, 1530 AD in the English Royal Court, B, 
18,500 years ago by prehistoric man, or C, 4,000 BC in China? The answer will be revealed after this. How's it going, Ben? It's going well, James. How are you? Well, I'm doing well. Welcome back. It's Gee, great, great to be you back. You just turned into bed. What happened to him? It's amazing. I just <laughs> lost about 30 years. Oh, one, one, you <laughs> lost 30 years? 30 years. You like... gained 30 years. <laughs> one trivia question and that's it. So, Ben, uh, we've been following the weakness. You've been writing some interesting stuff about it. What's your, uh, what's your overall bon mat du jour for the market? Well, I think the market, uh, the, the broad market risk asset uh, weakness, softness that we've seen lately is definitely playing into what's going on in the cannabis space. How could it not? Uh, cannabis stocks are correlated to uh, Bitcoin, to tech stocks, to FANG stocks to, to a certain extent. So it's going to be hard for cannabis stocks to rally when there's broad market weakness in risk assets. Mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, I think um, you know the 200-day moving average is an important benchmark when it comes to momentum. It's sort of, sort of like it's, it's held the the test of time in terms of being an ultimate momentum indicator. And just about everything is below that right now. Uh, Canopy might be scurrying it. There might be a couple. Kronos Group might be above that. But for the most part, everything's below the 200. And uh, if that happens, it's going to be hard to have a sustained rally, including HMMJ, which is below that too. So hmm. it's a couple factors that we have to work through to you know, right. improve sentiment. Right. Okay. So to what extent do you think that the chance of a uh, reversal a rebound in the cannabis stock is likely in January post tax loss selling, assuming a reconciliation between China and the US to some degree, whether or not we release the CFO from Hu Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Hawaii. Why you pronounce just... that pretty well, I think. Hua, hua. Better than I would, Amy. Hoo right. <laughs> whether or not they renounce her, do you think that there's a good chance of a reversal for cannabis stocks? I do, I do. Uh, I don't know how sustained it's going to be, but I think right now when you're looking at the broad market, when I'm looking at it, I think the broad market's starting to price in recession. I really do. You're seeing the first pangs of that um, happening or being priced in. The bond market just went negative on two and tens very briefly, I think. It's, it, now it's 10 or 11 basis points above that. That's almost never wrong uh, when short-term rates uh, start yielding more in long-term rates. So. Mm -hmm. um, but if I were to guess, you know, it's going to be a long process. You're not going to have recession in the second quarter of next year or third quarter of next year. It's going to be a process. You know, GDP growth still at 3% to 0.7%. So it's going to have to ramp down over time. So to answer your question specifically, I would say there's a very good chance that we could see a pretty sizable rebound uh, in the first half of or the first quarter of next year, maybe into the second quarter, tax loss sellings out of the way. And, and, and all that, and people pile into stocks, and we get that sort of you know, late bull cycle liquidity trap that, is, you know, that often occurs. So mm -hmm. I would say yes, I would think the first quarter next year could be, actually be a really good quarter, but we're at the end of the cycle, and I, you know, good chance that if we have recession in 2020 sometime, first half, then that's gonna start being priced in you know, second quarter of next year, third quarter, and we're gonna start to see maybe more downside action. But who, you know, who really knows? That, that's yeah. just my roadmap. Okay, so while I was away, uh, there was quite the uh, foo for -ra around uh, Hindenburg Research and Afria. And yep. uh, so, you know, we've got, we've got uh, Vic Neufeld has committed to the idea of rebutting the Hindenburg Research piece line for line at some point this week. Yep. And I know you came up with a great idea where we're actually going to evaluate his rebuttals line by line relative to the Hindenburg representations line by line and then score each of them and try to figure out who is really owning this debate. Yep. Yes. Yeah. But so so far at this point, what's your what's your takeaway from the whole Afria versus Hindenburg thing? Well, I think my ultimate takeaway is uh, that the truth maybe lies somewhere in the middle. Um, I think um, as time has gone on from that research release date, December 3rd, I believe it was, I think um, it, it looks better for Afria as time has gone on because there's been some discrepancies that have taken place and inconsistencies in the research that have cropped up. So I think it looks better for Afria over time. Hmm. That being said, um, 
you know, there could be some truth in perhaps, you know, shell dealings and uh, maybe assets being inflated before purchase and maybe there was some over purchase of assets. I don't know. I, I don't want to cast judgment. Right. But, uh, you know, there's a lot, there's, there seems to be an intermediary between everything that APRIA purchases and, you know, the asset that, that they ultimately end up getting as, as opposed to just a first party transaction. So that's not a judgment. Uh, you know, they're doing well. What they paid in LATAM was in line with other LPs like yeah. Canopy and Aurora. So they didn't right. really pay more. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, there, there could be some truth. Uh, I'm looking forward to see what Vic has to say, but it looks sure. very good on Apria, I think, you know, as time has gone on. Sure, the, the basic, the foundational premise, the foundational recommendation of, of the Hindenburg research with QCM was that this thing's worth nothing. And that certainly seems to have been unequivocally shown to be just a gross misrepresentation of the reality. Yeah, exactly, and, and that's, one of the big takeaways is that uh, it, it appears that there's some su significant embellishment going on. Mm -hmm. um, so for you as an investor, how important is that? Like for me as an investor, consistency of messaging and you know tone is critical. So if you come to me with a 40 page report and your opening salvo is this thing's worth nothing, and I start to go through the report and I found out that, well, that's a bit of an exaggeration. For me, the whole report becomes worth nothing because you can't rely on research where they're so willing, fast and loose with, with the idea of integrity to be so freewheeling and critical of a company, especially when they're trying to get people to go short and buy into their thesis. Yeah, I'd agree with that 100%. And, and that's what I mean uh, when I say that as time has gone on, it looks better on Afria's front I unequivocally agree with that. I mean, mm -hmm. even the title of the short uh, research report, I think it was something like um, Afria, a shell game with a cannabis business on the side. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that tells you everything you need to know about where it's coming from. Now, I think, you know, when it first came out and you saw, you know, 15 or 20 different line items that they put out, the initial reaction is, you know, even if some of it's not true or embellished, some of it's got to be true. But, I mean, when you actually look at it from, you know, uh, Drago's, uh, uh, subsequent uh, um, declaration that Apria was, was worth nothing, and then you know the title of the report, and all these sort of uh, exaggerations about what's going on in the report. It, it looks better on Apria, and I think they're going to probably most likely come out uh, this looking pretty okay. Yeah, and uh, it, it's going to look good hopefully uh, in a couple of days. Sure, all it did was make a another buying opportunity for a bunch of long investors at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much of the short covering they did in those first two days where they had their biggest effect. It's hard to say. I've seen this a couple things on Twitter, but I mean, there's no official declaration. Well, what is that, Twitter saying? Oh, well, I think there was a video that came out and uh, looked at the open interest on some of the options and they, and they saw that, uh, you know, the options I don't think were trading all that heavily before, and then there was a spike up, you know, a couple weeks before the report, and then uh, maybe some extra options activity at the time that the report came out, or just after, suggesting that maybe they covered. So I'm not sure uh, exactly. It's not really official news. It's just sort of anecdotal stuff that you see on Twitter. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, so what are you seeing? What are you seeing in the cannabis space that's really what you view as opportunity? in the foundational, formational uh, sort of stage? You mean for like junior names? Any or names. Anything? Do you see any, any opportunity developing in any names, be it junior or senior, that is sort of un, unrecognized at this point by the major market, by the broad market? Yeah, I do. I do. I, you know, there's some juniors out there that look pretty good to me that I don't think are maybe capitalizing or don't have that visibility, which is driving the share price right now. I don't know if I can give names. I mean, some of them may, may be clients and, and some aren't clients. But um, yeah, no, I, I, there are some names out there that I don't think are fully valued, most likely because they don't have that visibility and they're just getting caught in the dragnet of sector selling and just sort of they don't maybe have that bid underneath them yet. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, there, there are a few things I like out there, a few names I like out there. Okay. Um, are there any that you think are just danger, stay away? Uh, well, without, yeah, without going into names, I think. Um, <laughs> Come yeah. on, man. What good are we if we can't name names here? Well, I would go far, so far as to say that, 
Um, Describe the company's characteristics that you feel make it a risk or more of a threat to investors without naming names then. Well, I would say that, you know, perhaps small, there are a lot of smaller LPs out there. There are, you know, dozens that are trading on the Canadian Secur Securities Exchange and that maybe they don't have the capitalization, they, they don't have the money behind them and they don't have the deals to really support themselves. Um, adequately going into next year. Uh, they may not have the liquidity to grow and keep up with some of the bigger uh, capitalized names out there, the ones with supply deals. So they, they may find, them, find themselves lag behind right. if they're not cashed up enough. Uh, I think you've seen a lot of those companies out there and you see a lot of charts that kind of show you know, steady erosion and there's not much bounce to them. So uh, you know, listeners can kind of you know, do their own due diligence on that. But I mean, the charts in a lot of cases speak for themselves, I think. Yeah, uh, okay, cool. So then, um, you know, what do you think is going to make this market break to the upside? Well, I, it's going to be hard. First, the first thing I'd like to see in that regard is to have all the tier ones trade above the 200 day moving average, including H HMMJ, which is the benchmark ETF. I think you had Mr. Hawkins on here mm -hmm. uh, to describe that. But until that happens, it's going, to be hard, it's going to be very hard to get any sort of long-term traction and a real big bounce. Right. You might have a day or two um, bounce, and then it will fall back if it's not above that level. So people are going to be watching that. Um, and of course, the broad market as well. If we get that uh, liquidity squeeze that maybe some are predicting, and we do have that bounce or that pre-recessionary liquidity squeeze that happens on the upside uh, often in late business market cycles, you can get a significant run in the S&P. Who knows, there might even be new highs uh, before it's all said and done. Um, if we are at the bear, if we are near the end of the bear bull cycle and then things sell off again. So look for maybe a, you know, a, a market rebound three, four, or five months okay. into next year. Great, Ben, well thanks very much. We're gonna uh, get you the answer to that trivia question next and when we come back, Ed will be back here and we will talk to some, some other of our illustrious friends. So. Here's the answer to the trivia. So the answer to our question, when was the first recorded instance of psychoactive marijuana use? The answer is C, 4000 BC in China. It was used as an anesthetic during surgery. Cannabis seeds have also been found in Kurgan burial mounds in Siberia, dating back to 3000 BC and some of the tombs nobles were buried in in China and Siberia around 2500 BC, including large quantities of mummified psychoactive marijuana. Women like to be the boss. Mummified psychoactive marijuana. Yeah, well, I can tell you that uh, that's interesting. Who would have thought? 4000 BC in China was the first recorded use of cannabis. 4000 BC. You know, it's interesting. Um, have they got a newspaper uh, from that time frame to, to, to prove that? No, it's based on burial evidence, uh, mummified psychoactive marijuana, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, have you ever had any mummified <laughs> psychoactive marijuana? <laughs> ah, a little bit. A little bit, just a little bit. Oh, no, just a little bit. Um, anyways, so quickly looking at the broader market. Uh, yeah. As of right now, That's there it. are roughly, where did it go? There are 42 decliners, 26 advancers, 19 unchanged in among the 87 stocks that we're tracking across our indices. The, uh, across the four of them. Across the four of them. Now, we learned today that there are now a grand total of 109 issuers on the CSE alone involved in the cannabis space. 109. Huh. So that's uh, that's interesting. So we've got to flesh out our CSC index, obviously, and uh, you know the the and bottom line is getting back to that idea of the, about the fact that there's more and more issuers every day. Now we just saw one, two, three, four, five large cap issuers come to market above a billion dollars valuation in the last six months, and. Which one of those, this is not a trick question, Ed, but which one of those has actually performed well? Eh, none of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right? You're absolutely right. And which one of them have performed horribly? Eh, all of them. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. None of the above and all of the above. <laughs> 
Those are easy. Those are the kind yeah. of multiple choice questions I really like. I was good at multiple choice. Yeah, well, you know, the great thing about multiple choice is your chances of being right are far better than if there's no choice at all. That's <laughs> like, you, I got I to gotta invent the answer, yeah. and it has to coincide yeah. with the answer that the constructor of the question imagined, which almost never happens. I, I'm, I'm curious, where, where does the money keep coming from? You, 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 wouldn't you think that these people that are buying these issues, and I'm not trying to be, I'm just saying, after seeing a one or two or three or four maybe, you think maybe I'm gonna pass on this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be the lucky one. Yeah, that's right. Right? No, no, no. no. Oh, yes, this that, one looks this good. This one looks good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, that's just it. These days we're on a conveyor belt watching deals go by. And, and, like, and, nah, and the no, money is yeah. big, and it's coming from somewhere. Yeah, well, you know that the U.S. pent-up capital supply. No, here's the, here's the thing. People are all, well, so we saw, or we're going to see that Steve Palmer is generally bearish on the cannabis space. We saw that Steve Hawkins is generally bullish on the cannabis space. So between Entering those, a period of consolidation, though, he did say. He yeah. Said, well, but, so, so maybe a so, little longer term. Bear, you know, well, so yeah. they're both short term bearish, but the difference being Steve is long term bearish. Sure, sure. And uh, st well, Steve Hawkins is long term bullish, and Steve Palmer was long term bearish, which, you know, that just demonstrates the, the full range of sentiment out there among professional investors. The gamut. It's, the gamut, of, the full of, gamut of opinion. Damn it, damn it, the damn gamut. It. <laughs> or, and ram it, <laughs> and ram it, damn it. Um, but anyways, I, so. Yeah, I don't, uh, no, 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 it, it's, it's an interesting time, you know, yeah, like. Know. It's interesting times, is right. You think you see it all, and then you see Al, Al, uh, Altria come in with. Uh, $2.4 billion investment? We'll start there. We'll say, start with that. You know what, give me a little but taste. You know what, here's the interesting thing. It doesn't close that, until. Sometime in the first half of 2000. Sure, and there's lots of due diligence yet to occur. Is that, it, now, is it, pot? can they say, for instance, if they started to analyze this thing, start looking at the accounts, mm -hmm. what if they say, well, wait a minute here, there's not, you know, would they, can they, are they hooked on the hook here, or is this a... I have not read the letter of intent or whatever the actual document is governing the relationship right. at this point. Right. I mean, generally, a big company like Altria will not announce a deal with a little company relatively like Kronos yeah. until they've got a decent level of satisfaction right. that right. the T's are properly crossed and the I's are properly dotted. Yes. Now, yes. typically, in an effort to expedite you know, access to capital to consult, con to yeah. conclude the transaction, when they have a mutual level of comfort, they will announce the transaction yeah. pending 60, 90, 120 days of due diligence until the close. You've got you know, exchange acceptance to go through if you're Canadian listed. And, uh, and during that phase, if they were to find something wasn't quite right with the price of beans, then uh, and I, I'm and sure and they'd I, have the I, read, I read today that that, that deal is not closing until sometime in the first half of 2019. It's not like, See right there, that tells you that it's not a done deal. It's, I, I was a little, I was surprised. I thought, wait a minute, this isn't like, you know, one of these financings where it's done, bought deal, done, closed. Right. Well, even the, uh, even the uh, Constellation investment into, uh, into Canopy Growth, uh, I think it was 30 days after they announced the deal that the deal was concluded definitively. Okay. So there was a 30-day additional due diligence. I could be wrong. It might have been 60 you know, days. You know, I looked up Altria's market cap. It's $100 billion. It's This is a big company. This yeah. is much bigger than Constellation. What's Constellation Brands market cap? Oh. I, I thought it was $25 billion, but I, I could be wrong. You know you know what? You can't be wrong on this show, Ed. So no, you're No, not no I said I could be wrong. <laughs> no, but you can't. No, no, I, I can't be wrong, but I could be, but I can't. That would, yeah. yeah. Well, there we go. What's you know, yeah. So so big big tobacco company. I I'm impressed. I'm impressed that they said you know we're going to stick our toe in the water. But waning tobacco sales. That's the reason. Hmm. That's the reason. They that say more young people today are not smoking. You know they say the people coming up now, pretty well. Don't smoke. Lot cleaner. Pussies. <laughs> no, health-minded little pricks, <laughs> self-righteous little bastards. I hate millennials. No, they hate me too. Anyways, just kidding. I love millennials. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, nothing wrong with millennials. Just no. don't get no. it stuck. Don't get your foot stuck in it. Um, let's see. The uh, market capitalization of Constellation Brands Class A shares is thirty-five point seven billion. Okay, I said twenty-five. So yeah, I was, uh, I was were, thinking twenty-five years. You were not necessarily yeah. right. But that's so so so. Altria is three times bigger. Yeah. Hundred billion. Yeah. And, and and what was the market cap of uh, Kronos? Of Kronos. Prior to the transaction. I think about three, two yeah, and a half to three. In there. Two and a half. Pretty much where it is today, actually. Well, a little higher, a little <laughs> higher because uh, it is up a good. You know, it moved up. You know, you notice what what uh, one of our uh, our astute uh, uh, go to guys okay. like like it was either Dan or Brockstein. Yes. And Bro they said, you know, things are leaky in in Canada. Like seems that if people find out things before they're announced in Canada. Leaky, he said. Leaky. <laughs> and but he said he thought the constellation deal wasn't very leaky. It, it, it did take everybody by surprise because everything was pointing south. But look at well, remember, you know, remember, it did take me by surprise because right. we knew that Altria was out there fishing. We know that Altria is a U.S. company and Kronos is kind of U.S. centric in its minds and management. Mike, Al, Mike Gorenstein, the CEO, is American. Right. A lot of the right. funding that first went into right. the deal that became Kronos, which remember was the Pharmacan deal. That except, came out of the yeah, US. yeah, but except you know, like all stuff, all marijuana stocks were getting hammered. Yeah. And and yet Kronos caught a bid. And then it moved up 20%, maybe 25%, and then moved another 25% after it was announced. So, oh, Kronos is looking good today at 1735. Boy, that's 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 uh, way higher than when I last looked at it. That, I that, take it all back. Kronos has started to reflect it. So, market cap now at $17 a share is 3 billion, 3.1 billion. Yeah, but that doesn't take into account and I checked it because if you look at there's another 140 million shares going to be issued. You got to add that in at the, at you the mean price. upon the conclusion of the transaction. Yeah. So if the 140 million yeah. shares was added in yeah. there, ooh, yeah. that would almost double the market. five billion market cap. Yeah, yeah. something Closer like that. Six. Closer to six. Yeah, because I, I got a list from uh, of the market caps of the top 50 uh, companies that have cash, and they adjusted, uh, uh, Canaccord adjusted the cash for Kronos. Right. In other words, 2.4 billion on top of the, the thing. And then you know double the shares almost, yeah, absolutely. Interesting. And, and you know you know I looked up their last quarter. They they did three million revenue, and they they lost seven million dollars. No kidding. So not not a very. Uh, and, I, and again, I'm not. I don't want to. I don't want to sound like I'm judging, but uh, that's that, okay. You can judge. It was quite a leap of faith, I think, for Altria to step in there. <laughs> anyway, if you guys want any further opinion, just give me a call. I'm available. I'll be at the bar later. Oh, wow. Smoking and drinking. Smoking and drinking. Marlboros. Um, Marlboros. Marlboros. <laughs> Marlboros. Ooh, those are heavy duty. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go look, look at our audience right now. I want okay. to see who's yeah. got a question for us. And uh, let's see, who's asking the bright questions here? Um, comments from the audience. Uh, will Canadian MJ stocks profit from the farm bill? Is it the question of a viewer named Let's Do This? Will Canadian MJ stocks profit from the farm bill? Well, see, some Canadian MJ stocks are actively operating in the United States, so would they be beneficiaries of the farm bill? Absolutely. Because basically the farm bill, net-net, is a lower cost of inputs for CBD producers. Is the farm bill, is that, is that statute now, is that? No, it's not a done deal. Okay. It's being, it's in, it's in the process. It's wending its way through. Okay. But uh, yeah, uh, let's see. If APHA ever does another deal with DeFrancesco, then management should be replaced. Whoops, I'm reading comments from the... So here's the thing. You've been following the, story, the saga with Afria, and it's like uh, if you were to be a betting man, like it looks like the, uh, the one director there with, uh, with Afria has been the cause of most of their woes. Woe is me? Woe. woe now, who is that woe, director? Is woe, that... Is that uh, we're not going to name name names here. Okay. Okay. That I think that's that's fair. just that's, not uh, no, appropriate. No. But uh, 
You know, there are observations from uh, Fred in Toronto. Hindenburg has been eviscerated on Reddit and Twitter, in my opinion. So there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of discussion in the social universe right now suggesting that the research of Hindenburg is of a increasingly lower and lower quality upon scrutiny. Than they, than, than they purported it to be. Yes. Like to say it's worth zero, is, is, that, is, that, is that not tantamount to, look it, we're, we're short this thing already. We're going to put a, a, the lowest target we can because we want this sucker down so we can cover our shorts. Right. Is that, is that not blowing your own horn? Well, I think that's, um, that's market manipulation to the downside. Blowing your own horn. It always... So this is the thing. So the Canadian Securities Administrator came out with a uh, document, a bulletin, that uh, discuss their concern with the promotional activities of issuers in the cannabis space. And so I thought to myself that, well, that's great to be concerned with promotional issuers, but what about negative research that is equally manipulative in that it's based on sure. not untruths, lies, or my favorite term for lie, Bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> and yet the, so the guy comes out with the research, the stock sells off, he covers it short, he makes a huge end b by inflating and exaggerating negative sure. indicators in the stock. Sure. And, but if you do that to the upside and manipulate the stock to the upside, you're going to jail. Is that, is that an equitable administration of the, can, of the capital markets, do you think, by regulators? It seems, it seems like whether you're bullish or bearish, there's an, an element out there that are interested in blowing their own horn or sort of front running. You know, like this is a front run, right? This is yeah. a front run. This is basically, well, it's, it's a front run. And, and if you, let, let's say you got it, you saw this thing drop, 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 and let's say you really stepped on your short position around, say, five and a quarter. This thing went down to like 485 and right back to 885 mm -hmm. and now 780. Like it, if you shorted this thing on the continued weakness, you got your uh, nuts blown off. Yeah, I <laughs> got your nuts. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> Testicles for the, for the less, ah. less. Uh, yeah, I, look, 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 this is, you know, you know, I, I and, and, and you know, our Ben, our Ben, yes. Ben A, said he thought tomorrow morning it might you might want to stick your toe in the water and he called it and i was i was a bit of a chicken shit okay because it looked it looked brutal but well, again you, it always looks brutal yeah didn't you go short i shorted some chronos <laughs> <laughs> yeah how'd that work out well, for you? It, it, you know i only shorted 700 shares so it huh. wasn't like uh and it only went up you know i thought i was in big trouble but it only went up uh like two and a half bucks i, I was able to cover two and a half bucks right for, and it sold a couple grand here and there, you know. What has happened? Okay, I like to know. More. All right, uh, who's that? Nikki Domi, Nika Domi. I'd like to know more about no, know about Alifia. What is happening to them? They had that meeting last week. Alifia. What was their meeting last week? Yeah, Ed? they. they uh, well, you, you know what? They're, they're, they got the they got the fifty thousand patients. They've got uh, looks like a pretty competent guy, and and the CEO Jeff. He's a former hockey player. He seems very very capable. Hockey player. Well, he, he, he junior hockey. He just oh, okay. I, he seemed like a big fellow, and I thought, jeepers, creepers. He says, "Yeah, I played a lot of hockey." So, oh, oh you interviewed him? Uh, yeah, a while back. Uh, from its from moving, it moved from about a buck seventy five to almost five dollars. Oh, I said, remember that. And 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 I did I did interview him, and then then he came back in, and Ben interviewed him again. Mm. You know, so they got a lot going on. But look at what, what's trading at its highs right now in this space. In the cannabis space? I think the only one is... Kronos? Kronos is within a... Kronos has been higher than 17 No, bucks, no, it has, so. but it's close so, to its high. So when it's within 10%, I'll give them, you know, I'll give them that 10%. But like, look at, look at uh, weed. Weed's was 70 odd, now it's 40 odd. Yeah. Yeah, well... But, but when your market cap's five and you've got two and a half billion cash, you look pretty formidable. Yeah. And, and I think that's... Yeah, I mean, look, they're going to have a war chest to pick up pieces, to do whatever. That's the, the plan. So Kronos looks positioned here. 
Yeah, that's uh, an interesting question earlier in the, uh, in the discussion group was, what is Kronos going to do with all that money? Well, M&A activity, I think, is going to be high on the list. M&A activity. And I think a lot of it's going to be, you know, the, so, so, you know, if this deal goes through, Altria is going to have four members on the board, I think four out of seven. So they're, they're going to control this thing. Yeah. And that's, a, that, you know, when you've got a $100 billion company behind you, it's not exactly... Uh, it's really, you've been, you've been taken over. So if, uh, if, if, um, if Altria was to ex exercise all of the... Look, Ed. That ringing is really, that brain of mine, that little pea brain of mine hitting my, the walls of my steel plates. There's a ringing in my ear. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at the market close here, shall we? Just to uh, look at... Look at uh, the S&P close up, I think it did. Well, let's see. The big loser of the day would be Acreage, uh, Acreage Holdings, ACRG.U, lost 27 cents, down 1.52% to 1749, followed by Ceneva, which lost 16 cents, down 4.94%. So I guess on a percentage basis is really what we need to look at. So the big loser on a percentage basis, MJ.CNX, which is... Uh, don't know who that is, but there's a lot of companies that we don't really cover that well in the loss category. Looking at who's the big winner to the upside percentage-wise, BXL, oh, it's a three center, never mind. Grow, 14 center. Okay, so all the big winners today are penny stocks. Yeah, the, 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 not, not like it's, you know, I, I get the sense this thing's getting ready for another move up perhaps. Uh, uh, because it's been, the shorts have, have had their way for a while, but then they got ouched. Ouch. Friday, <laughs> Friday, and today, you, you notice they're slightly higher. Yeah. And the shorts are saying, how come these things aren't dropping? Yeah. And as, as every day that they don't, the shorts don't win, they get nervous and want to start covering, which propels the longs. Yeah. And then that's the long. An, that's an interesting term, though. Ouched. 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 Mm. Who got ouched? Interestingly, looking at the uh, cannabis indexes, indices, uh, on my NDI, the... Uh, Midas letter large cap actually closed up on the day, 0.59%, probably largely thanks to the increase by Kronos Group. Let's quickly go Kron look well, at Kronos the... Well, Kronos was up, Afri was up, Weed was up. Stage. So ranging the well, large was... caps by market cap, Afria closed up 8.8%, Medmen closed up 8.09%, yeah. Kronos closed up 2%. Aurora closed up 0.53%. Aurora coming out with that news about their Mexican... Uh, footprint, 800 stores, Pharmacia. Right. Pharmacia Mexicana. That's a pretty interesting thing. So we'll, that's, I think, the onset of, uh, can, of can THC. trust down 4% kind of surprises me. Well, I think probably the disclosure that Altria was uh, looking at CanTrust as a potential investment candidate, and they, and they came out and said, well, but we didn't, probably had a bit of a chilling effect on, on CanTrust stock a little bit. Green Organic Dutchman's still hovering around 305. That thing's had a hard time catching a bid since uh, yeah. since the major downturn. Hexo's down to 504. That's lower than when they announced their deal with uh, Molson cool. Coors, yeah. which, you know, at the end of the day, there's, there's the proof is in the pudding there. Mind you, a lot of these stocks, I think, are going to bounce back. Look at Organogram down at 474. That's a steal, if yeah, you, you ask know, me. Uh, you, know, you know, we were looking at, at like, these things, and, and you know, the, yeah, I mean, a lot of these things we've we've sort of we've uh, uh, analyzed uh, and, and and saw where a lot of paper was issued, you know, within the last six month nine months at much lower prices. So, oh yeah. So that they why should they why should they get uh, you know go you know why should they be rewarded? Yep. The other index that's up 0.41% is the Midas Letter Small Cap Composite Index, and on my screen here we've got. We range it by winners versus losers. So the big winner today was Choom, which has gained five cents at fifty-one cents. Boy, that stock was buck twenty a month ago. Yeah. After uh, Aurora announced an investment of twenty million dollars into Choom's, look at that. That might be a that might be a bit of a bargain. So this is what I'm thinking: is that if tax law selling is going to end in, you know, call it another week, then well, it goes right to the. the 
I think December 27th. 27th is the last day that you can actually book a sale of stock at a loss on your 2018 taxes if your fiscal year end is is December 31st. What day is Christmas fall on this year? Uh, I think it's Christmas Day again. Yeah? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know. I th- and Boxing the- Day next day? Probably the next yeah. day. Yeah. Do you know they don't observe Boxing Day as a holiday on the exchanges in the U.S.? No. No, I know that. I th- you know why? Yeah. Because there's no, there's no religion you're... involved. And there's Boxing Day, I think, in Britain, isn't there? There's Boxing Day in Britain. There's Boxing Day in Britain, but it's where everybody goes to the fights. Yeah, you know, and there was a big boxing event here on uh, Friday night. Or Saturday was there? Night. Yeah. Who? WWF. WWF? Yeah. Worldwide Federation. I don't know. Yeah, okay. oh, no, you know, there, was, there was the MMA. You know, what's his name? Oh, yeah. yeah. Our, our man. Our man, uh, Theodoru. Elias Theodoru. Yeah, but, but no, the guy, who is the guy? Uh, they, God, well, when you get old, age is a bitch. Eh? Oh. <laughs> you need a little prompter here. I, I need something to help me forget. Yeah, that I can't. You know, for, Bolivian I, marching. I need powder. something to forget that I can't remember. <laughs> right. Uh, let's see. Namaste closed the day up 3.17 percent here in the small cap space. Yeah. Another winner was MPX Bioceutical closed up 9.2 percent, eight cents to 95 cents on volume of 2.2 million shares. Liberty Health Sciences also bucking the trend in terms of the Hindenburg attack. This is interesting because the, the Hindenburg is starting to look like a lot like a lemon in that Citroen Research also has had a poor track record of you know, trying to undermine yeah. the credibility of cannabis companies on the short side. You know, look at, look at Liberty Health. That was, that was the big win. That was the big... Uh, that was the big rebound for, oh, hold on, I'm gonna pull up the chart on Liberty Health here. Let's take a look at this. So let's look at five days of, so the report came out on December the 5th, was it? No, December the 7th. I think it was, I think it was a week, I think it was a week ago today, wasn't it? I think it was on the Monday. Was it? Well, you, can, you know how. No, uh, no, no, it was on uh, the 6th, cause I was already in Miami. No, it was on the 4th. There it is right here, looking at this. Yeah, the week ago today. Right. Or, or that was the Tuesday. So it closed yeah. at, closed at $1.09, the day the report came out. Dropped down as low as $0.72. Cents. Okay, so there's your cover. It, here's all the covering. And now it's back at $0.96, cents, so $0.93. Cents. But a lot of these things don't seem to have the volatility they used to have. Like, they've, they've come down... But it's still early, right? Let's see if they're being accumulated for another big move. Okay. Uh, we have a uh, interesting little segment here about uh, smoking cannabis outside from the 420. Now that cannabis has become legalized, you're allowed to smoke and grow up to four plants per household, right? Well, not so fast. Hundreds of condo boards across Toronto have banned residents from smoking and growing marijuana within their units and on their balconies. Even though home growing and smoking is legal under the Cannabis Act, condo corporations are able to create their own rules that prevent cannabis users from enjoying the newly legalized plant. Some condo uh, corporations have decided to pass new bylaws or rules association with cannabis. If uh, the odor was uh, causing concerns with uh, neighboring uh, residents of the condo, uh, it, it is dealt with as a nuisance and uh, it can continue to be uh, dealt with as a nuisance. When signing a new lease, make sure that you read the agreement carefully to find out whether there are rules and regulations against cannabis use. So if you are signing a new lease, uh, your, your rights may be affected by what's contained in that lease. If there's no mention of cannabis anywhere there, then I would say it's safe to say, as long as you're not bothering anyone or causing damage, you should be good to go. And what if you're using cannabis for purely medicinal purposes? The Human Rights Code prevents any discrimination on the basis of disability, including with respect to accommodation. So in a housing scenario, if a landlord 
um, attempted to say no cannabis, period, that's it, and someone had a medical license, well, that could be an act of discrimination. I've been renting for about a year now. My landlord's always had the same policies regarding smoking. Like, it's just, we can't smoke inside. In my condo, I actually, I own it and I still can't smoke on the balcony. I, I guess it's considered a common area. Uh, I saw on the bulletin board, it's a new rule they're implementing, I guess, because of cannabis being legal. But no smoking indoors or outdoors, uh, which I don't understand why, but I do it anyway. Since uh, the new uh, legalization came into effect, uh, we have actually experienced no uh, elevated nuisance conditions whatsoever, so the urgency just doesn't seem to be there. I think, you know, a bit of mutual respect and consideration and cooperation means everyone can get along. Because when you're in a shared space, you know, it's impossible to control every variable. If you're not bothering anybody, then you know, it becomes more difficult for a landlord to interfere with what's happening in your unit. So what's the moral to this story? It seems as though if you keep things on the down low and don't put any focus on yourself, respect your neighbors, then you won't have any issues. Can we all just get along? For Midas Letter Live, I'm Sean Cookson. Your Canada Center. Where's Where Canada Center? Uh, that was that was a cool segment, Sean. You know, so uh, do you smoke cannabis at your house? Yes. Are you a renter? No. I oh. Am. No. So, do you have neighbors in close proximity? Yeah, I mean, I have a, um, um, a, a smokehouse. No, but I have a, uh, a a balcony that's not connected to anyone else's balcony, so I have oh. a separate balcony, my own balcony. Oh, okay. Um, so. You know that it doesn't really bother anybody, but I'm sure that people that have sectioned off balconies that are right beside each other, I can see uh, where the complaints would come from. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't smoke in my own home. Right. Um, I probably wouldn't grow in my own home. No. Why not? No. Well, I mean, I. It's, wanna... it, it's a limited space. Oh, I see. You know. So it's just a space consideration. Yeah, I mean, if I had a house, I'd consider it. Oh, okay. uh, but it's a condo. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I would necessarily grow. Uh, huh. But I mean, on my balcony, I'm facing west. Beautiful area to grow, maybe two. Yeah. We'll see. Are we allowed to grow doors on our own balconies? Uh, you should be able to, but some. Uh, landlords or condo boards are saying that you can't hmm. um, because uh, the balcony is considered a common area. Your, your own private balcony is considered a common area. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's interesting. I've had my fair share of run-ins with, uh, with uh, the boards of condo associations. First of all, because I used to throw uh, parties, legendary Wild parties, parties yeah. that, uh, you know, the they tried to toss me out on the grounds that I was creating a nuisance for the other um, other other residents, and uh, all of their efforts never succeeded because at the end of the day, the uh, the, the people lodging the complaints wouldn't show up to the hearing, so right. it'd be a case of you know <coughs> nobody to represent their side. Yeah. So they never got to throw me out. Uh, you know, I was just people just pissed at, at that time, and then it kind of just goes away, right? It's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a lasting. So the question I have is that, is it not conceivable that there's a constitutional basis to, you know, basically challenge the condo boards that might be actually being guilty of overreach by, if the, if, if the law says that it's okay for me to smoke it in my own private mm -hmm. area, and a balcony is part of the premises that you rent, doesn't matter what the condo board says. Yeah. That's my space. I'm smoking dope. Well, and the thing is, is that I own the condo, right. so the condo board should be working for me. Right. So I'm not. Right. I'm not going to, you know, take that from them. If you know, there would have to be a, nest, a, a meeting set up for, uh, you know, all occupants of the building, and uh, you know, to make that final decision on any regulations uh, going forward. Hmm. Um, in my building, for example, nothing has come up uh, regulation-wise or anything. Uh, so, you know, until that time, like mm. I said in the story, stay on the down low, be a nice neighbor, be good, and, uh, you know. Yeah. 
my uh, my landlord is uh, encouraging me to grow cannabis because that way his son won't, you know, need to spend so much money on cannabis. Yeah, because <laughs> as a neighbor, I should be able yeah. to provide some. I don't know if you want to say <laughs> that he could say on the you, air. But he could say to you, but, like, you know, come on over for dinner. And meanwhile, his son goes over to your place and run. Rob you out of your cannabis. He would never do that. No, no. Like, where, what are you living? saying about my neighbor? Yeah, where are you living? <laughs> <laughs> we live in Cabbage Town. Very, very, uh, very congenial is, is neighborhood. Does he, he let you take the, the cabbage? Uh, no, he grows cabbage. Cabbage Town, there's lots of cabbage in the backyards. It's sort of Well, isn't cabbage. that another name for, for pot? Cabbage? Uh, actually, lettuce. probably. I know what lettuce, lettuce is. Salad. I've heard my buddy's son call it salad. Salad. Like, yeah. he's, uh, my buddy's son came, he actually came over and he's like, you know, he's like 19, he's got hair down to his ass. He's like, yo, yo, so what's the policy on smoking salad around here? And I just laugh. I said, you can smoke it anywhere you want. I don't care. That's, just old school, place down. that's an old school word, isn't it? Salad? salad? I don't, it? We never called it salad when I was a kid. I don't know. What Sounds do you call pretty old school. Uh, reefer. Uh, dope. Weed. Reefer. Ganja. Reefer. Reefer Ganja. Ganja. We used to say, let's go smoke a tortuga. That was our proprietary term. Tortuga being Spanish for turtle. How about a number? You ever heard of that one? Let's uh, let's go light up a numbers. Let's go. <laughs> but we usually, when we were younger, we usually smoked hash ah. more in Quebec. Right. We used to, we used to yeah. uh, smoke a lot what of hash. What is it with people from Quebec and hash? I don't know. It's, it's great though. It's, <laughs> it's fantastic. I know. But then, what did you call it when you smoked it? A spliff? Because that's what well, we always call. Well, it. if it was pot and hash together, we would call it a salad. Uh, really? Yeah. A salad. A salad. Cocktail. Huh. We used to call anything salad. that was hash or oil a spliff. And but that ultimately got bastardized over time to where any anything with that you rolled was a spliff. Yeah. yeah. Which is now like if you said to a millennial, let's smoke a spliff, he'd be like, Yeah, great, what do you got? Oil, hash, weed, what? Right. Maybe. I don't know. Any millennials out there? Any millennials out there? Tap in your answer. What do you call it? what do you call a spliff? What's the difference between a spliff and a joint, first of all? And uh, a also, what about a blunt? here's a question for the audience. If you live in rented premises, are you going to observe those rules or are you going to smoke where you damn well Raging please? Rick, he's got a solid mix of cannabis oh, yeah, yeah. and hash in a joint. There Raging oh, Rick. He must be from Quebec. Raging Rick, Maybe are you from he is, Quebec? I don't know. Could be. I mean, a salad. <laughs> but I mean, that's a salad. Hmm. But we used to call it a salad. Because ah. yeah, well, we you French. wanted to have the Quebec accent. That's right. Yeah. It's the Frenchie. Hmm. Uh, well, all right. Well, thanks very much for that, Sean. Right now, we're going to talk to um, Steve Palmer from Alpha North Asset Management. Hey, my guest. This segment is Steve Palmer, President and CIO of Alpha North Asset Management. Steve, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Steve, we're in the midst of tax loss selling season here, and that combined with some of the other aspects, macro, economically, geopolitically, seem to be really creating a downdraft in the market. What's the position from Alpha North Asset Management? Well, we focused on small caps, so mm -hmm. our benchmark is the TSX Venture Index, which is down 33% year to date. I think uh, it's my opinion that this is the last week for tax loss. I keep track of a lot of uh, statistics on the venture market, and, and as far back as I have data until 1990, if you look at that from December 15th to the end of the year, on all 28 occasions, the market has been positive over that period. So I see no reason why it would be different this year. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming that the, the negativity will be done by Friday. So Steve, to what extent would you say that the end of year reversal is uh, a result of the end of tax loss selling versus other sort of more macro cy cyclical influences? Well, a big part of it's the end of tax loss selling, I think. Um, there's also, you know, although you're not supposed to do it, there's games that go on at the end of the year with uh, high closing, and uh, maybe it's just a function of there's no more sellers left, so it's easy to stocks to rebound hmm. into year end. I see. And uh, so what, does, uh, what, does, what sectors are you exposed to that have performed well versus others that have not performed as well as you might have wanted? Well, it's, uh, the selling uh, this year has been across the board, really. Like uh, the hot sectors of uh, crypto and cannabis have all corrected significantly. Um, for us, probably the best sector this year is the healthcare space. Hmm. X of the cannabis. Yes, I don't consider cannabis healthcare. No. no. <laughs> okay. Um, so then, do you think that the cannabis sector's weakness? 
uh, after so much, so many years of, of positivity is a result of sort of fatigue of the wave, so to speak, as opposed to uh, weakness in the fundamentals, which have arguably always been there? Um, fundamentals are questionable in the cannabis space. Uh, it's, in our view, it's been a bubble. Mm -hmm. um, and it, when you have a bubble, the things are going to correct significantly. If you look back at the, I, I compare it to the technology bubble in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, even the, the companies that survived and, and are big winners today, like Amazon, Amazon declined 95% during the, the bust in 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. So I believe the same thing is going to happen with cannabis. Mm -hmm. Most really? of them will be down 80 to 90% from the peak at some point, but there will be survivors and they will rebound. Sure. Okay, so do you think that the as yet uh, unannounced deprohibition in the United States could be uh, an offset to that? I mean, I look at the, the fact that cannabis really hasn't become legal in the majority of countries at this point, broadly. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like there's all this pent up positivity in the cannabis sector that will yet take it higher. So do you think that that 90% correction you're referring to is something that's more of a short-term thing in between those macro catalysts, or that's just broadly where you think that the valuation is going to be in time? I'm not saying that there won't be uh, uh, some upside from where we are today before that happens, but uh, in fact, I believe there will be. I think they've corrected enough at this point that there will be another uh, move higher mm -hmm. before, before there's another move lower. Okay. What's, what exposure does your fund have to cannabis? Uh, we have, so we've avoided the growers, uh, largely. It's a commodity type business. Um, we've tried to focus on some niche uh, places, because companies that either do, have something proprietary. Mm -hmm. That's a big focus for us. Okay, so uh, more on the technology and delivery side, consumer packaged goods side. Yeah. Oh, okay, so now I also know that uh, because we're Canadians that you've got some exposure to the resource sector. Mm -hmm. And how has that performed for you this year? Resource stocks have not done well either. Right. Um, uh, gold looks like it's, it's trying to move higher. Yeah. Seems like it's bottom, so I'm uh, positive on that space. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will also take a lot of the base metals with it. Mm -hmm. So I think the market right now is setting itself up for a significant move higher. All sectors have come off, but we could get a coordinated move to the upside. Sure. So is there any sector that you view as more opportunistic relative to the others going into 2019? Not really. There's not one big sector that I'm particularly focused on. I think they're all going to do well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So how about, uh, how about um, new sort of sectors like the artificial intelligence and some of the AI plays out there. Do you think mm -hmm. there's a real potential for a, a new bubble in these stocks? Uh, down the road there could be a bubble, but there isn't right now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a lot of opportunities in that space. Yeah. yeah Do you think that um, the sort of contraction in the valuations of crypto and cannabis, two of the, what have been the hottest sectors in 2018, mm -hmm. do you think that might set the stage a bit for a recovery in the commodity metals? Um, it could. Like, uh, if investors get scared out of these other sectors, or want to take profits in cannabis or whatever, uh, they'll have cash to redeploy in other sectors. Right. So do you think that, though, the I mean, one of, the, one of the great discrepancies that I've been observing in the mining space, and I'm sure you must have too, is the fact that we're seeing the reported uh, stocks and uh, inventories of key metals that are used in large quantity industrially, zinc, copper, et cetera, mm -hmm. showing decreasing you know, viability, yet the price does not reflect that decreasing availability of these metals going into the future. And so it looks like at some point the, the supply and demand metrics are kind of out of whack. This, this, it would almost demand that the prices for metals go higher because we are heading towards deficit in especially mm -hmm. copper and less so zinc. Mm -hmm. so. The fundamentals are positive. Um, 
in the last few weeks, we've had a number of companies that have announced uh, letters of intent or, or new purchase orders for their product, and the stock price has done nothing. Uh, investors just don't care right now. Hmm. Because of the fear that's uh, permeating the market as a result of the heavy tax, tax loss selling? I think so. It's just, uh, yeah, there's, they're, um, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of guys, um, you know, they say that, oh, they, the bloom has come off the rose in the, in the cannabis sector. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, it seems that the, the negativity in the marketplace is, is largely exacerbated by this confluence of, well, you've got tax loss selling, you've got, you know, macroeconomic risk as represented by the, the updraft in the interest rates by the Fed, you've got geopolitical uh, sort of geopolitical slash macroeconomic risk in the trade war that Trump has sort of opened mm -hmm. on multiple fronts with multiple countries. To what extent do you think that the normal tax loss selling at this time of year has been compounded and exacerbated by those effects, those additional effects at the same time? Yeah, well, there's been so many IPOs on the, in the cannabis space. Like, uh, I track over a hundred names and two years ago there was just a handful mm -hmm. uh, so the market's been flooded with um, um, cannabis companies uh, I think a lot of the retail investors are looking for a quick buck uh, many of them have done quite well right out of the gate like they doubled like uh, in short order and that's the game people have been playing trying to flip flip these for a double and move on to the next one mm -hmm. So do you think that the uh, there's been several large billion dollar plus IPOs that have typically been characterized by a few commonalities? One, they've all got these super voting structures where essentially a couple of insiders control all of the votes in these companies. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they they've done these these uh, IPOs at ridiculously accelerated valuations in a small time frame mm -hmm. and I'm going to uh, you know I'm not going to refer to any names specifically but where you know they did their first raise a year ago at you know sub a dollar and now they're doing IPOs at 20 20 plus dollars mm -hmm. and the last five I've noticed with super voting structures they're also typically US multi-state operators that trade on the CSE all these characteristics, the last five of those that have come out have all sold off from their IPO price and now sit at somewhere around 30% or more below mm -hmm. the IPO price. Do you think those, that series of large, sort of large cap cannabis IPOs has had a severe chilling effect on the market? It has, and, and investors need to be aware of the cheap stock that's in some of these companies. Like when, when somebody owns shares that cost them five cents and then and it goes public at a dollar. I'm just making up numbers here, mm -hmm. but like there's a high risk that those guys are gonna wanna lock in some gains and it's gonna put pressure on the stock. Yeah, right. So then how do you approach the cannabis space going forward? If we're in that point in a, in a bubble market, in a mania where the you know, the easy money's been made. Now we've got a surplus of opportunities that are characterized by decreasing quality of opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, so how do you, how do you, how do you address that going into 2019? Well, as I said before, if, if they have something proprietary, that, that is something we like. I think some of the international opportunities are probably more attractive than the domestic opportunities at this stage. Um, I always look to make sure that, that there's no cheap financings done, like uh, uh, we're, we're not going to ever take a position in a company at a significant multiple to where insiders or others have, have got positioned. Um, those are some of the things we look for. Sure. Uh, the CSA, or the Canadian Securities uh, Administrators, has issued a bulletin uh, cautioning investors about some of the promotional activities of the uh, issuers recently uh, and among the concerns of the Canadian Securities Administrators is that there are issuers creating you know a sense of expectation that would be considered uh, let's just say a little overly optimistic 
Um, and so is that, is that something that you're seeing from where you sit as, as becoming more prevalent in the market relative to, call it, two years ago? Uh, there's a lot of promotion that's going on in some of these companies. Uh, some of them spend uh, hundreds of thousands a month mm -hmm. on promotion. Um, usually when the promotion stops, that's when the share price rolls over. Right. I see. Okay, so what then, what really excites you about the market in 2019? Is there anything that excites you? Or are you just more or less very I'm bearish? generally very positive given where the market has uh, settled here. Uh, all the sectors have pulled back. Um, we have uh, several biotech names in the portfolios that uh, have a significant catalyst coming up next year, like uh, phase two and three data that uh, we believe have very good odds of success. Um, and then there's some technology names that we have too that are, um, I think are going to get a lot of traction, continued traction next year. Okay. So uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about the Alpha North Asset Management Fund? Who are, the, who are your investors? Who is it an appropriate investment for in your view? Well, our main fund, the Alpha North Partners Fund, is a long bias small cap hedge fund. It's for accredited investors. Um, so we take a diversified approach. Uh, we, it's, so we invest in all sectors. Um, we're looking for situations that have a lot of leverage to the upside, so where we can do, do many multiples of our investment amount. Um, we do a lot of private placements in that fund, um, so we pick up warrants usually that give us the, the leverage to the upside. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right, Steve, well, that's great. Appreciate your input as usual. We're going to leave it there for now, and I'll come back to you in due course. We'll have another conversation. Thanks for joining yeah. me. Okay. <laughs> I don't think Steve's very bullish on things. Well, you know, he's been around. I mean, he probably looks at things and calls a spade a spade. I mean, it looks, yep. it looks a little sloppy, although the candle on the S&P was pretty good today. Okay. Nice, nice, uh, nice uh, green candle. It's a big, big. Uh, this week, hammer. next week, we're going to have this weekend. I just want to let you know we're going to have uh, the new CEO of uh, CanTrust is going to be here on Tuesday, tomorrow. Yeah. Is it tomorrow, or then is that the following week? <laughs> Can't remember. We've also got the CEO of uh, Green Brands, Green Brands, Green Brands, GBB. Oh, that's the one that's got the top management. Uh, yeah, the A team. The A team of branding, Victoria's Secret. Is that thing? Is that thing uh, moving along? It's moving along. Is it? <laughs> what do you mean by that? It's moving along. Sure, it's moving along. It's moving along just fine. Yeah, but which way? Anyways, that concludes our show for today. Let's okay. see you tomorrow. Thanks very much. Don't forget to subscribe. Bye.